but I guess this is the praise band practice Good before. Good morning. Good morning. We are looking at the front of that bulletin. I told Rachel Kramer not to put in anything about the Eagles. I'll bet you had something to do with it. Remember, on Tuesday evenings, we do have our Bible study, and unfortunately, last Tuesday, the blue handout sheets were on the front pew, so folks who got here maybe after 10 of, 10 of 6 didn't even know they were there, so Carol, they were there. We'll make sure for all of you who come this week, we have study guides that a little a little further into the Bible study, we'll make that available. And we encourage you to invite friends, particularly on the last Sunday of this month, February, which isn't that far away, because during worship, the pastor from Bethany Slavic Church will be sharing about life in the the Ukraine, when it's at war, and by then, it will be two days shy of a year. Uh, also about ministries back and forth, and ways that we can help. And he's a very well-rounded person, very uh, versed on this topic. So just keep that in mind. Uh, should be a very special morning and a lot of learning. Any other announcements this morning? All right, we'll, we'll quiet our hearts for the prayer. <laughs> God, we gather in your house with a lot of energy this morning. We thank you for the privilege of freedom to worship, for the friendship, love, and support that is in this room, and that comes from you in heaven above. We have gathered to please and to honor you, and to find encouragement to keep you first in our lives. We look to you with the eyes of children looking to their Heavenly Father for your grace and wisdom and guidance for the days ahead. We give this hour to you and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And at this time, Greg and Carol Swales will lead us in hymns of praise. Oh, 
No, he didn't. He made us to where we have emotions and stuff. It's just like I love chocolate pudding and you love vanilla pudding. We are free to choose which one we like, just like we are free to choose who we love. So why do we have why do we need Cupid then? We don't. You really think there's a little man that flies around shooting people with a love arrow? I guess not. So why do we need Valentine's Day? Well, we don't. But it is a nice time to tell those you love that you love them. And you get chocolate. Well, that's just a bonus of it all. Last year, my mom got flowers for my dad. She was actually happy about it. I would have been really mad. Mad? Why would you would have been mad? Because you can't eat flowers. Give me chocolate. I see your point. Maybe this week would be a good time for us to tell our friends and families that we love and appreciate them. Sounds good to me. Have a good week, everyone. Don't forget to be a good friend to someone. Yes, don't forget Valentine's Day coming right up. A time to share our joys and concerns. I'm going to ask Brenda to give us an update on Amy. Yes, we thank God that um, Amy dreaded that surgery, but you said she really wouldn't have had to have went very well. She's home again and coming along nicely, neck surgery, and we're so grateful. Oh, the needless pain we bear from one of the old hymns, all because we do not carry all of us to God in prayer, but thank goodness. Um, does anybody have an, an, any current news on Joe and Reed. And if not, that's okay. Most of us have seen him this past week, and Joe continues to improve very slowly. Very slowly. Any other prayer concerns today? Joe. Uh, struggles we bear. 
because we resist just surrendering it all to you. We thank you for many, many answers to prayers, for good things touching our lives, for a mild winter, for your love and care to each of us and to everyone who breathes. We lift our concerns to you. From a wider picture, we pray for, for the end of a war in Ukraine, for all of the earthquake survivors in the Middle East, for renewal and rebuilding and a turning to you and finding your help to be completely sufficient. We thank you that Amy came through this surgery well and pray for your healing on her in many ways. We pray for all who are sick among us and especially for Joe and Reedy who are dealing with unforeseen struggles last year at this time they would have never dreamed they're facing what they are now. May you give them grace and patience and wisdom to walk through this season of life. We also pause, each one of us right now, and lifts to you an unspoken concern. We thank you for hearing helping and loving each of us personally. And now I ask you all to join me in, in praying in unison. Number 668 will begin. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, Hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 We will turn now to number 452, leaning on the other <laughs>
your Bible to Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 15. Where in verse 12, we encounter what seems to be one of the stranger verses of the Gospels. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 now beginning with verse number 2. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Now what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your, your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there is not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now verse 12, here's my key verse. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This verse, number 12, has fascinated me with year, for years. And you see my title, The Kingdom of Heaven Has Been Forcefully Advancing, and Forceful Men Take Hold of It. Different translations vary on how they interpret this. I think the NIV here does, does a very fair job. Jesus is simply saying, <coughs> that the Christian life doesn't happen automatically. It must be pursued and maintained. In John Bunyan's book, <coughs> The Pilgrim's Process, Progress, it is really an allegory or a symbolic story of how Christians go through life and make it to heaven. It tells the story of a man named Pilgrim who walks the road of life to heaven. As he gets near the heavenly gates, many other believers are standing around it, afraid because there are guards at that gate. Then Pilgrim saw one very brave man go to the gatekeeper and say, Write my name down, and he fights his way into the kingdom of heaven. Is this an accurate picture of the Christian journey? Or does this book exaggerate the struggle that it will take you and me to get into heaven? Can't we just walk into heaven by the grace of God? Many people say that today. For them, it doesn't take much to get into heaven. Most Americans still believe they will make it into heaven. They say all you have to do is kind of be good and decent, and you're all in. So do we fight our way into heaven, truth and nail, or do we stroll in with 
with our hands in our pockets. And I admit, starting with me, Christianity is an easy way of living for most of us. It's not that much of a struggle. In Luke 13, 24, Jesus told his listeners to strive to enter through this narrow gate and that many will come to the gate, but few will actually enter it. In Ephesians 6, 12, Paul describes the Christian life in this way. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not in a literal boxing ring. But you and I wrestle against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, and against the spiritual hosts of wickedness This is in the heavenly places. Paul does picture our lives in each season as an ongoing spiritual struggle uh, and, and which theologians say we walk by grace from grace to grace through each of them. The writer to the Hebrews constantly emphasizes we need to put effort into our spiritual journey. And he says in Hebrews 4.11, Let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, R-A-S-T, that God gives, lest any of us fall into disobedience. In Acts 14.22, Paul and Barnabas tell the new believers who have heard about this Jesus and the kingdom of God that we will go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. Today, there's not a lot of talk about Christianity being a struggle. If I was speaking in Nigeria this morning, I'd be a totally different approach, wouldn't it? That's what they say, every hour, two Nigerians are murdered for their faith in Christ. Very different. We don't hear much about the necessity of suffering. Your suffering and mine as being necessary to fit us for heaven. And often I speak about we walk this life unto God, holding joys and blessings, and broken hearts in the other hand for things that so much need God's help. And we wonder how long we have to wait. Jesus also makes a comparison of the self-righteous religious person and the desperate sinners as he goes through the Gospels. He says some people have to become so sick of sin that they charge toward God to get it right and to get healed. It is that just throwing yourself upon God forcefully taking hold of the kingdom of God, of life changes, of healing, of a better way of living. One writer said, the favorite human hypocrisy is to make a choice about something and refuse to do it. We call this living on spiritual credit. You and I can buy many things today and not make our first payment until August this year. So many people make choices and purchases they're not willing to pay for, and it ruins their lives. Some people say they want to be healthier, but don't watch what they eat. Richard uh, Rudyard Kipling said that if someone does not get what they want from life, either they really didn't want it, or they were not willing to pay the price it would take. I don't think that's always true, but it makes a general point. And Jesus is making the point here that the price of the kingdom of God is high. It's not a fluff walk. And Jesus demands that we count the cost of following him. That's why one reason we gather every seven days, to remind it ourselves. There is a cost and a straight and narrow way. Our peace will come to us at a high price. Our peace often comes 
through intense inner struggles about the priorities that call for attention in our lives. I love Ephesians <coughs> chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. It says, you and I, as we leave worship in a short while, and we are having cookie time, even though it's Super Bowl Sunday, <laughs> that, as we, that we must prepare for this week for a form of spiritual war and often fight our way to a new place with God. The gift of God's grace is free, but living by grace is costly to us. Christians can become so complacent, they want to loosely follow, us, follow the good teacher Jesus, but reject most, if not all, of the teachings of the Bible. So all of us are so tempted to write our own New Testament, our own Bible, and create salvation on our own terms. I believe we all do this to a small extent, hopefully not to a total extent. This passage warns us that passionate and forceful and desperate persons are the ones who meet God, who enter the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we need a desperation for more of God in our hearts. And I don't know about you, but I felt it in those three hymns. I just did have very touching and moving to me. I remind you that I fear hard-heartedness. Because you don't know you're being hard-hearted. You just are. You're being unsensitive, insensitive, and unloving, and drawing back from our higher calling. Some, some years ago in Liberty, Missouri, a new church began, and it was called Desperation Church. And I don't blame them. And it was a recovery church. If you can search online the contemporary music titles, you will find over 50 songs with the main word in it being desperation. No wonder. Desperation means urgency, a single focus, and a clear purpose. It is desperation that turns into our transformation. And, you know, the old saying in life is, what moves us to make a needed change in our life? It always comes back to one thing, a crisis. A crisis that asks us how serious are we to face the issue, our spiritual journey, or whatever the matter is. Desperation is the beginning of transformation, allowing God to begin something new in our hearts. People can sometimes see God and his love on our faces. When Charles Spurgeon was training ministers, he would tell them, now guys and gals, when you talk about heaven, let your face light up with heavenly glory. And when you talk about hell, you can use your regular face. <laughs> When we live and share the word of Jesus, it will turn people's lives upside down. Just his word, his teaching, initiate a transformation. You know, the honest truth is the world came to hate Jesus. He made people uncomfortable. He took the smugness out of religion. Instead of memorized prayers, which Jesus mocked them and called, and called them babblers, baby talkers. Jesus said to cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, as a model prayer. Jesus exposed sin. He rebuked unrighteousness. He never compromised or held back. And he was nailed to a cross. Why should it be different for any of us? My challenge in Colossians 2, 6, scriptures say, just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in your faith, 
overflowing with thankfulness. And that's the sign that God's getting in thankfulness. How can we remember this simple message and this simple phrase, we take the kingdom with some violence or force, with energy or effort? And I, I'm, I was trying this week to think of a thought. How could we all remember this message? I thought of the title of one of Pat Benatar's songs from 1983. And someone said to me, no one here is going to know that song. I titled this message, Love is a Battlefield. How many of you remember that? Put your hand up. Whoa! See, you remember it. And I won't see any more. In verse 2, you remember Pat Benatar. She said, we are strong. No one can tell us we're wrong. Searching our hearts for so long, love is a battlefield. Now notice I didn't quote everything she sang in that song. Not in church, but that one seemed to fit. Love is a battlefield. I must say, and you know this, <laughs> in the Inquisition, in the Crusades, taking the kingdom violently was taken way too far. I think this means on our spiritual journey of our own emotional investment and personal focus on God. From the days of old until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and forceful people, the passionate, are the ones who are going to take hold of it. May we build our lives on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. Please turn with me to number 443, the solid rock. Thank you. 